hello everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm Dr. Yusun Eminem. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Hong Kong, as, as mentioned, and an honorary fellow at Deakin University. And for the next one and a half hours, I would love to share some ideas on the idea of feedback literacy, particularly from the viewpoint of closing the research practice gap. And how I have sequenced this one and a half hours is that I would first like to spend the first half of the session, roughly 45 minutes, by sharing ideas from uh, uh, the critical review that we conducted on feedback literacy research so, so far. I will start by framing this review from the viewpoint of the research practice gap in assessment and feedback research, and then offer you some snippets from this, from this review paper. In the second part, uh, I will move further. So in the review, we offer some future trajectories for feedback, uh, feedback research and practice. So I will follow those footsteps a bit, and I will also ask you to take part in a bit of a group activity, um, trying to think about the futures of, of feedback and feedback literacy. But let's start by uh, looking at what we found from the review paper. But before I do that, I would like to go a bit further back and start by discussing why any of this is, is important. So for me, any conversation about feedback literacy really starts from the idea of a research practice gap in education. Um, Martin gave a very lovely introduction uh, uh, just before, but I would like to uh, like to add that I am uh, first and foremost a teacher myself. So my background is in is actually in mathematics education. Uh, and you can really see that teacher background in everything that I do in as a assessment researcher as well. And perhaps this is why I am extremely interested in this gap that we often have between scholarly research and practice when it comes to uh, in education more broadly. But of course, uh, in this seminar, I will be focusing on uh, assessment and feedback in higher education. This gap means that educational research is not always uh, completely informed by practice and practical issues and questions that might be brought, brought, up, brought up from the actual practice by actual teachers and students. And at the same time, educational practice might not always be research informed. And in fact, I would like to start this uh, <laughs> seminar with a rather provocative idea just to wake you up a bit. I know it's a Friday morning for everyone. I actually argue that we already have a lot of feedback, on, a lot of research on feedback. Uh, in this slide, I offer just a couple of snippets of this huge amount of literature. For example, the review paper by R. Van der Klei uh, conducted a, a meta review and identified 68 review papers on feedback. That is a huge amount of, uh, of journal articles, book chapters, conference papers published on feedback in higher education. And on the slide, you can see a couple of other uh, reviews and, and uh, th synthesis as well. So my bit of a provocative starting point here is that perhaps we should actually stop the press. There's already a lot of knowledge out there. Perhaps we should take a little break from research and make sure that we can actually implement this vast amount of knowledge in practice. <laughs> I'm not sure if I actually agree with myself here, but just to start this uh, seminar off with a bit of a provocative idea. So why is this important for feedback in particular? Uh, I mean, it's all the research in educational educational studies we have. Quite often when, uh, when you pick a random article on feedback in higher education, the starting point is often quite similar. Uh, many many papers frame their study uh, from the viewpoint of a bit of a crisis in feedback. For example, Winston and Bob, a very powerful article on uh, the interaction between assessment feedback and grading, uh, end up noting that the student voice is raised loudly in dissatisfaction with assessment and feedback as measured by institutional service of the student experience. They offer a couple of international examples. So we tend to state in feedback research that in practice, we do not see the ideal world that we perhaps sometimes frame in our educational research. And I would very much argue that there is a bit of a gap uh, when it comes to research and practicing in feedback and in higher education. And this is the background that I would give to feedback literacy research, which is the focus of my of my talk today. 
So feedback literacy has gained a lot of scholarly, uh, scholarly attention during the recent years. It offers a novel approach to address this gap between research and practice, perhaps bringing that, uh, or <laughs> reducing the gap and bringing these worlds closer together. It does this by formulating the idea of feedback literacy, which is which refers to students' capacity to make use of feedback, as Carlos and Baud put it in the, the seminar paper from 2018. It refers to students' understandings, capacities, and dispositions needed to make sense of information and use it to ex, uh, enhance work or learning strategies. And here on the slide, you can see this well-used picture uh, from their article uh, portraying the model of student feedback literacy consisting of appreciating feedback, making judgments, managing effect, and taking action based on the feedback comments. Similarly, teacher feedback literacy has been defined as the knowledge, expertise, and dispositions to design feedback processes in ways which, in, which enable student uptake of feedback and see the development of student feedback literacy. So instead of only focusing on enhancing feedback design and feedback practice, this novel idea enables us to also look at the feedback agents in a way and develop their capacities to make make you make uh, better use of feedback opportunities. And this is a rather novel approach. And it also seems that it's this approach has been taken, taken quite largely when it comes to research. Um, Sorry, I realized that there's a bit of finish on the uh, on the slide, but uh, just yesterday evening I checked how many references there are for the uh, Carlos and Baud 2018 article. Almost 1,000. That is a rather high number of citations for a high educational uh, educational study. Last summer I attended a early conference. Uh, which was a seek for assessment and higher education research, and four of the sessions were completely focusing on feedback literacy. So this concept is really gathering scholarly attention. Similarly, in Scopus, with a very uh, <laughs> lazy and quick search, you can easily find quite a few papers published in a very short amount of time. So this is why me and my colleague David Carlos, we thought that it would be a very good time to provide a synthesis of this early yet blooming phase of feedback literacy research. With would be an excellent timing to provide a roadmap to this evolving field by learning what has already been done in other fields of many kinds of uh, many kinds of literacies, such as assessment literacy, digital literacy, and so forth. So we offer a loving critique in a way, criticism uh, to a field where we're also taking part of as assessment and feedback researchers ourselves. So some initial thoughts that we had before we conducted the review. Uh, first of all, uh, we noted that this term feedback literacy was coined by Sutton in 2012. Yet this idea re-emerged in 2018 uh, as, uh, uh, as our Carlos and Baud published their paper. That, yeah, I hope that those uh, Dutch comments are not referring that you couldn't see my slides changing, but if they if they are about whether I can share the slides after the presentation, absolutely. <laughs> um, what we also noted before we started started conducting the review was that there seemed to be rather diverse approaches to what we even mean by feedback literacy. On this slide, you can see just a couple of various examples, one referring to a psychometric scale development study, one referring to uh, a conceptual study on feedback design, and one referring to feedback literacy as a social material practice, looking at uh, uh, ideas such as power and agency in higher education. So we already had this uh, basic understanding that this field is rather diverse. And what, what, what was also interesting, we thought, was that the idea of feedback literacy was clearly grounded in higher education literature. It really originated from higher ed research and it has uh, mostly stayed within this bound, uh, this uh, context, which is something very interesting. So what we did was that we conducted a critical review. Uh, it was a synthesis of uh, 49 of the first journal articles focusing on feedback literacy in higher education research. Uh, very briefly, we used the approach of science and technology studies. So we conducted a conceptual analysis of how 
ed uh, educational research had come, uh, come to frame this new innovation of, of feedback literacy and what were the underpinnings of this concept. So we were interested in looking at how has feedback literacy been studied? How has this idea been conceptualized? And how does how is the feedback literacy student and teacher constructed in research? Because this is a new, novel, innovative way of framing uh, human beings in, in higher education. So, oh, if, if you're interested in reading the whole study, here's the link. Uh, and you can use the QR code as well. But I'll share the slides uh, to everyone, of course, so you can get back to this later on. All right, so what did we find? First, to offer you an overview of the data set. So we had 49 studies on feedback literacy, uh, and this study was uh, published in July 2022, which means that these studies were published before March 2022. Most of them, uh, so 24 of them, uh, concern general or multiple disciplines, which I think is quite uh, important to note. And also a large bunch of them were conducted in the language or and or academic writing context. Most of the studies, studies were focusing on student feedback literacy, and most of them were empirical. But there was also a rather large amount of uh, 16 conceptual studies in this, in this data set. A very brief overview of what we've found in the findings. So uh, this is a new evolving field of research. We found pockets of good practices, uh, many excellent instructional models, uh, in fact, already in the beginning phase of, of feedback literacy research, it seems that we have multiple excellent models to study feedback research in, in the future. Yet we're still waiting for interventions, uh, those more um, rigorous interventions with pre and post tests and, and, and so forth. So it is an evolving field. Many of the studies, such as the Hanang Su uh, paper that you can see on the slide, is a classroom study conducted by a teacher and um, based on a qualitative qualitative work. Okay, let me offer you a couple of other ideas from this overall data set, but I won't go into the very details as I'll, I'll stay on the conceptual level here. Um, to offer you a brief overview of methods, I know there's a lot going on in this slide. Uh, I'll tell you what to focus on, so no need to panic. You can look at all the details from the paper later on if you're interested. So here, what I think is notable is that when we looked at the uh, uh, 30 uh, free empirical papers, uh, most of them were qualitative, and most of them were drawing on rather simplistic analytical methods. This is understandable, since we are talking about an evolving field of research. Thematic analysis was mentioned in 15 of these, and eight papers were offering unclear methods or not even mentioning their qualitative analysis methods. Uh, I think this is something to note in, in future research. But again, it is rather understandable since it is an evolving phase for this for this field or for this area of research. Same thing can be seen in the uh, emerging quantitative methods. So most of the studies were focusing on descriptive, descriptive reports, uh, reporting means uh, standard deviations and, and so forth. However, two of the studies uh, reported the first two quantitative scales for feedback literacy which is notable. Uh, and in fact, there are at least two other ones uh, published after the review was published. So uh, this also seems to be a new emerging, emerging area. So based on the methodological review, we proposed that there is a need for more sophisticated metho methodologies. And we definitely need to move beyond uh, simplistic qualitative methods. There's a plethora of cool, rigorous, <laughs> a qualitative uh, data collection and data analysis methods out there already used in higher education research. So it's it's not that we wouldn't have options. We just need to use those options and perhaps uh, move beyond inductive approaches as well. So many of these uh, studies started started by collecting a data set and then looking inductively what might feedback literacy look like. Whereas now we already have many conceptual and practical models, so we can actually use these models to collect data and to analyze data. We really call for longitudinal approaches. And since there are already a few quantitative scales uh, published, they will be very helpful in, in longitudinal work. But I think this also applies for qualitative work as well. So how do students' feedback literacies 
develop over time in different contexts. This is a very uh, intriguing um, idea for future research, particularly in the context of programmatic assessment. So when assessment is aligned with program level learning objectives, how does feedback literacy develop as students um, move, move further in their studies? Next up, I would like to offer you a few ideas about how feedback literacy has been conceptualized. So, so far I've been talking about the methods used and some of the findings uh, that, has, have, that have been found based on these methods. But what was interesting with this review was that, as I noted in the beginning of my talk, we knew that we would find many different kinds of conceptualizations. And we wanted to find a theoretical framework or model that we could use to analyze these different uh, theoretical assumptions. Because if we have a psychological skill development study, and on the other hand, uh, almost like a discourse analysis, looking at power and discourse in higher ed, these are very different kinds of approaches. And what we did was that we wanted to use an existing framework and we sought for a framework and ended up using a framework of academic literacies, which is not a new framework at all. It was uh, published by Leon Street, uh, uh, perhaps most notably in the uh, 1998 paper, which is already a while ago. Academic literacies refer to uh, the, the aim to understand academic reading and writing in higher education. And of course, feedback is a huge part of these, uh, these ideas. And what Leia and Street did was that they developed a model for how academic literacies are often talked about, and they developed on that model. And we actually thought that this idea would be very helpful to conceptualize feedback literacies as well. So we used their threefold theoretical framework to analyze our data set of feedback literacy studies. And yes, and it's very uh, important to also note that in the Sutton 2012 article, this uh, framework was actually used to, to discuss feedback literacy. So in order to analyze what is even meant by feedback literacy, we use this framework that I'll briefly introduce right now. <laughs> so uh, Leia and Street uh, conceptualize three different ways to talk about students' academic literacy. First, they argued that back then, uh, students' academic literacy was mostly addressed as academic skills. They argued that research has mo a higher education research had mostly focused on the deficits of students, how students could be better taught writing, uh, reading and writing skills, technical skills. And the idea was that students are lacking skills, and then the point of research is to offer them those skills. And the point of interventions is to offer those skills for students so they could develop their academic literacy. And according to Leia and Street, this approach was often taken by uh, psychological individualistic uh, research approaches. What they argued was that this model is not enough to understand academic literacy. It is an extremely important way to understand this phenomenon, but it, in itself, it is not enough. So they also uh, conceptualized academic socialization, which built on builds on the skills approach, but now considers academic literacy from the viewpoint of uh, academic cultures, how when students enter higher education, they need to not only learn new skills of reading and writing, but to take part in a new socialized world of academic cultures and learn new social processes. What kind of language uh, is used in academic writing, for example? That's not only a, a matter of psychological skills, but a matter of understanding the world of academia. Finally, they note that I mean, this is not enough. What we need is one extra layer to understand academic literacies in full, which they call is the real approach of literacies. This focuses on academic power relations, questions of identity, what kinds of students and what kinds of abilities are often uh, connected with academic literacy, academic reading and writing skills, and which students are offered uh, opportunities to practice these skills uh, early on. And what Leigh and Street were arguing was that uh, this framework is a, is a good one to understand how research has framed academic lit literacy. And we thought that this would be an excellent framework to un understand feedback literacy research as well. And it 
did end up being a very useful framework. So using this framework, we analyzed the data set and noted that most of the, these 49 studies, 38 of them were taking a feedback skills approach. This means that they conceptualize feedback literacy as trainable and measurable attributes of students and teachers. Skills that individual students and teachers possess and can then be developed. In this way, uh, feedback literacy was, or feedback skills, was framed as a measurable psychological construct that could indeed be measured through, in, uh, through quantitative instruments and then developed through interventions. I'll offer you one example of an excellent study uh, that takes this kind of a feedback skills approach by uh, uh, Hui Ho and, and colleagues, which is a student feedback literacy intervention. They note that interventions to develop student feedback literacy have gained traction recently and empirical studies have begun to be undertaken. This was the dominant approach to feedback literacy as feedback skills. 16 of these 49 studies uh, took a different kind of an approach. And here I must note that many studies uh, were categorized under uh, under two or even three of these categories. So one single study could have been categorized in, into many of them. So feedback socialization refers to not only feedback skills, not only individual psychological skills, but acculturation of students and teachers within various cultures of feedback, feedback in academia. This approach framed feedback cultures as a subset of wider academic cultures and feedback literacy or feedback socialization, sorry, now refer to the process that students and teachers needed to go through in order to take part in these feedback cultures. Uh, for example, uh, in excellent Veronica Romanti and case, they looked at feedback cultures, histories and literacies, noting that social material and cultural factors in context are crucial as they shape interactions, experiences and processes. We argue that feedback literacy as a construct could not be under conceptualized to overlook their role. So culture is really taken as the main concept here and, and social processes. Finally, a smaller subset, only five of these uh, 49 studies really took a literacy approach, as Leia and Street put it in their work on academic literacies. These five papers took a social, completely social epistemology and even critical epistemology towards individualistic and, and even humanistic notions. Feedback literacies were now seen as something that is constructed through discourse and power. And I think an uh, excellent example of this kind of a study was the brilliant paper by Karen Cravet on feedback literacies as a social material practice. This is a hugely different approach than the feedback skills approach. As Kravet puts it, today work within this area has been underpinned by cognitive and affective conceptions of feedback literacy. And feedback is commonly conceptualized as a binary dialogic uh, relationship between feedback giver and recipient within a humanistic perspective. So now feedback literacy is not only seen even as an attribute of humans, but also non-human agents such as computers or, feed, or online feedback systems. And feedback literacy is seen as uh, constructed within discourses, within agency and power between these different human and non-human agents. Okay, so <laughs> as I said in the beginning, uh, different kinds of approaches were most certainly uh, identified. So what to make of this plurality? Uh, we argue that we do need to stray towards conceptual clarity and consistency in how we talk about feedback literacy. Because at the moment, feedback literacy refers to multiple ideas that are not only different definitions or definitions that work in different contexts, but these are really conceptualizations that have very different epistemological and ontological underpinnings and assumptions of what knowledge, what scientific knowledge even is, what is feedback, what is literacy. So these are very profound differences that we identified. This is not necessarily an issue at all. Uh, in fact, as an interdisciplinary researcher myself, I find this uh, exciting. The question is how to make use of this plurality of approaches and definitions and conceptualizations. Perhaps uh, a more diverse terminology might help us to understand what is going on. So what we argue in our paper with uh, with David is that perhaps 
when we focus on those psychological individualistic notions of feedback literacy. We might even talk about feedback skills. Are these feedback literacies from a psychological point of view even literacies? For example, one of the uh, uh, published uh, uh, quantitative scales feedback literacy by Song puts uh, self-efficacy as a part of literacy. And we argue that this is uh, perhaps not very reflexive when it comes to earlier literature on what literacy as a, as a concept means. There is a risk of a deficit model towards feedback literacy. And here I argue that we can learn a lot from earlier research on assessment literacy, uh, both in higher education and at lower levels of education. What I mean by a deficit model is that there is a risk that we end up blaming individual teachers and students from much broader issues of feedback uh, in, in higher education. Uh, and this is something that has already uh, happened in assessment literacy research, which has, has a longer history. For example, in a recent paper by Ko and Depas, it is argued that research has clearly shown that teachers in many education systems around the world lack assessment literacy due to their inadequate preparation in classroom assessment. These authors are not simply blaming teachers, they are blaming the systems who, that are not training the teachers enough. But still, this kind of a deficit approach only focuses on individual skills rather than uh, social, cultural, and even po political aspects of whether our educational systems allow our teachers and students to use their uh, assessment and feedback literacies. So what we end up asking in, in our review is, is feedback literacy in, in fact a literacy? There's a very exciting paper by David Vincent uh, from 2003 called Literacy Literacy, where uh, Vincent argues that uh, the term literacy has become attached to too many disparate practices. We have more and more literacies. And if, uh, with, uh, by using 20 minutes in Google Scholar, I could find so many different literacies from AR literacy to coding literacy to data literacy to design literacy to psychological literacy. So what we ask is, is feedback literacy really a literacy? Is an exciting, intriguing idea, but whether it is a literacy uh, varies some for, uh, future investigation. Um, very briefly, I'm looking at the time, just to a couple of other ideas before opening up the floor for uh, discussion and questions. So we argue that we do need to look at the conceptual boundaries between feedback literacy and other ideas, such as generic skills in higher education. We already have decades of research on ideas such as critical thinking, communication skills, collaboration, and so forth. And we have this, dare I say, an ocean of literacies. So where does feedback literacy sit within these worlds? And what are the boundaries? How does feedback literacy differ from self-regulation in feedback or interpersonal skills in feedback? So if we take feedback skill, skills as a psychological construct, I think there's much more to do with the uh, conceptual boundaries and also the corollary. So what is feedback literacy not? Where, what lies beyond the boundary of this idea? Um, I'm going to briefly introduce uh, this idea of the making of a feedback literate person uh, before taking, taking questions. So what this idea of literacy has done is that it has enabled us, as mentioned before, a way to talk about students and teachers taking part in feedback rather than talking about feedback in itself. And this is a novel way to know students and teachers. As uh, Philip Dawson and colleagues put it in their, in their paper, there has been a shift in the unit of analysis to understand whether learners are well equipped to participate productively in feedback and how they can be supported better. And we Put this kind of a process of, of individualization into its context. Into its context, we know that there are many systemic issues underlying uh, the the, uh, the sustainment of student-teacher interactions in higher education at the moment. There is a worldwide trend of mass higher education, widening the access to higher education, um, and in doing so. Uh, making the class sizes in higher education bigger and bigger, which of course sets uh, boundaries of what we can do in feedback design. We also know that the common good models of higher education are being eroded in many contexts that we can see from research on students as consumers. There's a brilliant paper by uh, Naomi Winston and colleagues on students checking the grade and logging out of the online system because they don't care about feedback, only focusing on grades. 
we have shift in funding models that are not perhaps valuing teaching as much as they are valuing uh, journal uh, article publications. So we have many systemic proto issues uh, 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 presuming what, how and why we conduct feedback in higher education. So there might be a risk of what we call pedagogization of feedback, the tendency to frame systemic, economic and political issues in pedagogical terms, mainly as matters of cognition affect skills and pedagogical design. And this is a risk for feedback literacy, we argue. It might allow us to explore feedback through the modern, modern means of individual skill development, psychological skills, design, interventions, quantitative measurements. And this might change the idea of who is responsible for tackling the issues of feedback. As Moller and colleagues put in their absolutely brilliant piece of work, one of the clear advantages of having feedback literacy of students is that they are not dependent on the necessarily limited opportunities, such as resources, time and classes for input of their work from staff. So the promise of feedback literacy is that it might empower students and teachers to make use of the limited feedback opportunities in higher education and thus offer, as Dawson and colleagues put it, lifelong learning. In and the danger is that in non-reflexive hands, we end up using this concept as a way for holding individual students and teachers accountable for these much pro structural issues and inequities of higher education. So we frame feedback literacy as a powerful idea for reimagining feedback in higher education, but we also know that it does run a risk of downplaying these systemic issues of feedback by framing them primarily by means of pedagogy, psychology and skill development. All right. At this point, I would be glad to take uh, some questions, ideas, thoughts. There might already be some of them in chat and I will stop presenting now so I can also see you. There's one question in the chat. It is about um, the link between feedback literacy and feedback culture. You mentioned in the model by Leah and Street um, the socialization where the, the cultures uh, play a role. How is the relationship between the feedback literacy and the, the feedback culture of the group? So how do the feedback literacy of the students or the, the persons in the group affect the feedback culture of the group? And specifically, do you know if there is uh, research on feedback literacy and feedback culture in the professional practice? Well, the second question, which is a much easier one, I would really direct you to the work of uh, Veronica Robocnazzi. Uh, I'm not sure if that concerns professional practice, but those are, uh, so Veronica's uh, two papers are uh, covered by Ed Pitt. Uh, maybe Naomi Winston, still. Uh, first offered by Veronica, they offer a, a, a very nice idea of feedback cultures and feedback literacy and their interaction. So I really uh, direct you to these papers. Um, when it comes to the link of cultures and literacy, so I, I would say that this differs a bit whether you take the feedback skills approach or whether you take the feedback socialization approach. If we take the idea of feedback skills, psychological skills that can be measured and developed, I guess culture is something that affects these skills and then we might conduct interventions in different countries, higher education systems and see what um, how these skills differ and how they can be developed through interventions in different cultures. Whereas if we take the feedback socialization skill uh, approach, uh, then they are really interlinked because to be feedback literate, you need to know the cultural norms in your own context. For, for example, academic writing differs greatly from uh, writing in high schools, which is uh, uh, not only a matter of skills, but also a matter of culture. And this is also true for feedback. So this link would be a bit different from, uh, based on these two conceptualizations. And the um, follow-up question on this is uh, about very interested in the feedback culture. Could you type Veronica's last name, please? We, we will share the, the slides and her name is in the slides because you already mentioned uh, the paper uh, of her. So that will be okay. fine. And ah, okay. <clears throat> another question from Sean uh, is about, uh, could you give an example of feedback literacy as literacy, as social epistemology, ep epistemology? 
what would that look like? Mm. There's a there are some interesting um, so far conceptual ideas about this uh, published in, in one paper uh, led by me, one by uh, Joanna Tai and colleagues, and uh, about feedback literacies in in plural when you want to emphasize the social material, the power, the discourse uh, taking part not only by individuals, by as a, almost like a network between different agents. So feedback literacies might be something that are that are situatedly uh, constructed between me and my computer and some peers who offer me feedback through an online system. And all this is about taking part in feedback discourses. So it's it's a very completely different uh, approach to what is knowledge, what is educational research, what is feedback. Great, thank you. And I'm looking at seeing his thinking and if you want to, to ask a follow-up question, uh, then put on your microphone. Um, no, sorry, thank you for that answer. I don't actually have any follow-ups. Um, I I kind of recognize the, the notion of, of the, the network you're constructing, but I was wondering what that might look like in practice on a day-to-day -day basis. What? How do I create a an epistemology of feedback, if I can call it that, in my in my daily practice. Mm. Oh, an excellent question, and there's more certainly need for more empirical research on this matter. So, I guess one one way to think about it would be that uh, if if you uh, ha have a break in your internet or something happens to your computer, and then there's a this uh, network of, of feedback literacy is it's somehow disrupted and then that affects everyone in the network. Perhaps that might be one way to think about it, but um, but also you might take a completely, uh, if you're interested in like discourse analysis, critical discourse analysis, you might look at the ways of how we even conceptualize feedback and how does feedback uh, occur in academic discourse and how it how it differs from other things such as talk, conversation, <laughs> discussion that people have and how these diff different social norms take part in these different social practices. Uh, but so far this is a uh, conceptual, um, a bunch of conceptual ideas. I would really welcome more practice driven uh, uh, empirical research on these rather theoretical ideas. Okay. There's a question by Mieke in the chat, but I think we will address that question in the second part of your webinar. It's the question about um, what would be your advice regarding putting your findings into practice? How could we uh, do a first step in helping teachers and students to become more feedback literate? I'm not sure if you want to answer that question right now or leave it for the second part. Yeah, I mean, there's <laughs> this. 49 papers that we analyze are all about this question. Um, I could link you any single one of these absolutely brilliant papers and they would have a lot of answers for that. And, and I already have quite a lot of knowledge about this issue. So, for example, if we think about the original student feedback literacy model by uh, Carlos and Baud, we might start from uh, uh, coming up with classroom practices that make students appreciate feedback. We might talk about uh, feedback and emotions. There. Uh, and we might design feedback in a cyclical way that enables students to also take part in feedback uptake. uptake. There's so many ideas that I don't even know where to start from. <laughs> I just get excited because that we already have so many of those ideas. And I perhaps one single paper that I would like to point out, particularly since I can see uh, Renske's uh, smiling face on my screen. <laughs> Her absolutely great paper on our uh, feedback design to promote student teach feedback literacy. That's really my go to paper when to answer this rather complex, complex question. Yeah, we have had a webinar by Renske uh, last January, I think. So we will post the link to the uh, recordings of that webinar in the chat. And um, another question from Vinciana. What definition would you give to feedback socialization? What definition? I'm um, not sure if I understand the question. I would actually use simply that definition. So the definition of of feedback socialization uh, 
meaning that when students enter higher education, they need to learn how to take part in new feedback cultures, which might completely differ in different countries, disciplines. For example, I, I was born and raised in uh, Finland and in Finnish academia, and now I'm currently teaching in Hong Kong, where the feedback cultures are completely different. And even though I'm a qualified teacher, my background is in teaching, I suddenly as a <laughs> as a teacher, my feedback literacy is, <laughs> is being disrupted because I've needed to learn a, a profoundly different culture of what feedback means and how feedback is, uh, uh, is enacted in classrooms. So the definition really goes back to the idea of, of social practices, culture, reaching beyond those uh, individualistic ideas. Yeah, thank you. Do we have time for more questions? Are there any burning questions? I there, there, there is one more on. question, so I, I, will, I will read it. It's from Renske and um, she thanks you. That's so kind, she says. And a question that she gets a lot uh, is how to measure it. There are quite a lot of projects in the Netherlands in which groups of teachers are designing feedback literacy interventions, but they, and also Renske, struggle with outcome measures. What are your thoughts on this? Mm, well, there are quite a few instruments published at this point, so do I answer your question if I say <laughs> pick one of them and <laughs> the, the one that fits your uh, theoretical underpinnings and use that and measure how students feedback literacy is developed? Yeah, but well, I was wondering, would questionnaires match the concept of feedback literacy in the first place? And is there any of the current instruments that you would like uh, recommend or would prefer better, given how much thought you and David have been given the definition and the concept of it? Because I think they quite differ a lot, the instruments that we have now. And for all of them, there's some reason maybe not to use them. Mm. Yeah, this is this is a tricky one. Um, I, uh, I I'm actually rather critical towards the feedback literacy measurements that we have so far. Most importantly, because, well, as I mentioned briefly in the presentation, I'm not sure if they are really about literacy. For example, the idea of including, from a purely psychometric point of view, including self-efficacy as a part of someone's literacy is just, for me, is a bit of a mismatch. But more importantly, I think these studies ignore what has already been done, what kinds of measurements we already have in the field of feed feedback research that might not use the word literacy, uh, but uh, measurements for like students' feedback uptake or students' uh, feedback um, response. Uh, for example, there's an, there's an excellent uh, quantitative measurement by Anastasia Lipnovich, which is, no, I can't remember exactly the name of the scale, but which is very much in the same world, not using the word literacy. So I'm actually quite critical for publishing more <laughs> quantitative measurements before looking at all these already existing measures that look at students' feedback up uptake. Thanks. But I could go on for hours about this, so maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe it's time for me to proceed. What do you think, Martin? Um, yeah, there's... Oh. There are still uh, questions in the chat, but I think it's a good idea to move on to your second part. And um, we have time at the end for some questions as well, so we can pick up the questions then. Absolutely. And of course, yeah, I'll share my contact details. So if you happen to have any big questions, ideas, thoughts, you can, of course, email me and or we can have a coffee break on Zoom someday. So the chat. All right. So let me just continue sharing. I still don't want to update my driver, but I would like to share my screen. Um, all right, I assume you can see it. So next up, we still have around 42 minutes, and I would like to offer you one possible way forward. So in this review, we've tried to make sense of what has already been done. and. We could, of course, give you 20 different ideas of what we think <laughs> might benefit feedback literacy research. As mentioned, I strongly believe in, in uh, mul multiple approaches, interdisciplinary research. So I find all these approaches of feedback skills, feedback socializations, feedback literacies, I find them all 
very exciting and I hope to see more interaction between these uh, between these different conceptualizations. But finally, I would like to offer you uh, one idea, which is to lean towards that uh, idea of feedback literacies, taking a critical approach to feedback feedback literacies. Uh, and I'm trying to take my time and I, I'll be talking for roughly for <laughs> 11, 12 minutes, after which uh, I will have a little group task for you, uh, after which there will be time for uh, some mutual conversation. So, um, possible and I think uh, a rather necessary um, future direct, uh, direction for feedback literacy research and practice is a social political approach. So what we ask in the end of the review paper is whether the previous reported issues of feedback are in fact issues about feedback. So we have these issues of large class sizes, timely feedback and so forth. We ask whether they are, they are in their core, in fact, much broader issues about higher education and the social political landscapes of, of current high, uh, mass higher education models. Again, a bit provocatively, we ask, does higher education provide a context where the findings of feedback research can be implemented? And if not, what should we do about that? So in this final part of my talk, I would like to frame feedback literacy as a critical practice. This idea was put quite nicely in the paper by uh, uh, Joanna Tai and colleagues, which was in a data set in which they state that feedback literacy might not just be about reading the world, but also about editing or rewriting what is possible in feedback. And given that I started my talk by talking about the research practice gap in feedback, I argue that this is particularly important uh, when it comes to spe specific idea of uh, assessment and feedback. So how could we frame the different agents in feedback from this idea of critical feedback literacy? So next up, I will introduce a couple of ideas. I'll show you a few snippets of undergoing work. So, so far I've been focusing on this review paper that has already been published, but I would like to offer you a couple of ideas of uh, how, uh, <laughs> how I'm trying to uh, just how I'm trying to take up these ideas in actual empirical research. So practice as I preach, that's, that's the uh, saying that I was going for. So how could we frame a uh, feedback literate teacher as a critical agent? So what is the role of feedback literate teachers in paving way for more sustainable assessment systems and cultures for feedback to flourish? We know that currently in many contexts, we might have teachers who are very strong in their feedback literacy, as, at least if we take a psychological approach to it, but the higher education system around them might not offer them very good opportunities to use their feedback literacies. So what can these teachers do? Um, could the teachers change the system from within? Perhaps at least on a smaller scale. Uh, there is a lot that individual teachers in higher education, uh, what they cannot do, but there's also a lot that they can. And one, Inspiring our branch of research is uh, research on teacher agency in curriculum change. For example, Johanna Annala has been doing uh, exciting work on this. So individual teachers, of course, can have power in their own context of departments, faculties to try to shift uh, assessment and feedback policies, cultures, practices towards more, more sustainable ones. Um, <laughs> I wanted to offer you uh, one example of, of uh, what we did uh, at the University of Helsinki a few years ago. So uh, these, these publications, if, if you're interested, you can read them. You can see my name in there. But uh, here, uh, the project was uh, a project called Digital Self-Assessment, which was led by uh, uh, Dr. Johanna Kramer and Dr. Jokke Hasa, whose names really need to be mentioned here. Um, we had a bit of an issue at hand uh, a few years ago. So we were working in a large mathematics department and we had a student cohort that was not perhaps very interested in uh, feedback or feedback uptake or ideas such as self-assessment. So what we did was something that back then we didn't know to name it uncreating, but this idea is something that has gained uh, increasing attention over the past couple of years, particularly in North America. Uh, so we try to change the system from within in a way by disrupting these grading mechanisms that seem to be uh, 
setting barriers for students uh, feedback literacy. We didn't know how to use this to inspect them because we not using the word feedback literacy, but we did know that the mathematics students were rather oriented uh, towards getting high grades and not perhaps very reflective in what they were doing. So what we did was that we tried to <laughs> do one way of ungrading. We uh, tried to render grades meaningless and it's a long story that you can read from the papers, but the point here is that we try to get rid of grades as they said in our specific context in the very exam driven context of mathematics, they were setting us barriers. And in this course context, we were able to get rather nice results when it comes to student uh, assessment and feedback, uptake, student agency, these things that we discussed in the papers uh, as, as we did this. So basically we needed to change the culture. We needed to change the context in order for our feedback practices to work. And that's what we did. And and now you can read um, many other papers on uncreating teachers, uh, refusing to create if grades set barriers for their feedback and assessment practices. So it seems like there is some kind of an uh, interest towards this concept at the moment. So the point here is uh, that critical uh, feedback literature teachers can do many things in their classrooms. What about uh, feedback literature students as, as critical agents? What I think we sometimes forget is that it is students who might be the ones who strive for change, who strive for more and better feedback in higher education. Uh, and student unions and organizations might sometimes even be the key agents in the questions of uh, more sustainable assessment and feedback practices. I wanted to offer you one uh, practical example from what I'm uh, from a project that I'm currently undertaking. So I'm currently uh, doing a qualitative longitudinal study for teacher uh, pre-service teachers in Hong Kong uh, when it comes to their critical feedback literacies. And here's, for example, one student from this uh, from this data set who is an early education student in a university in Hong Kong. And this student is explaining to me how they get their drive to do what they want to do to be become an early educator because they want to offer their students an assessment free environment in a way. So the student tells me that young children are like a piece of white paper. Early educators should really pay much more effort, effort by telling them they cannot do anything they want and we will not judge them because everyone makes mistakes. We should encourage them to explore more than judging them first. So in this project I have been looking at uh, pre-service teachers in this highly exam and grade or oriented context of Hong Kong uh, educational system where and how these students strive to become educators who might create alternative futures for, to, uh, for their students since they have gone through the system themselves. Very interesting emerging findings and I really encourage further research on the critical feedback literacies that our students both in education and beyond uh, might use and what that might look like in practice. What about researchers? <laughs> I think there's also room for discussion about uh, feedback literate researchers as, as critical agents. If as we have this research practice gap in, in feedback in higher education, I do think that us feedback researchers also have a huge responsibility in trying to do something for this situation. So how to enable feedback research to really uh, benefit others, not, not just researchers and not just the uh, publication lists of, of feedback researchers. There's a lot of potential when it comes to participatory approaches in, in research, such as participatory action research, design-based research, co-design approaches to assessment, policy-oriented research. I do think there is a conversation to be had about the responsibility, almost like a moral responsibility of feedback researchers in trying to build more sustainable futures for feedback, where it might be possible to implement those ideas from our feedback and feedback literacy research. And this, I argue, is really in the heart of being a critical feedback literature uh, agent. Um, I am running out of time, so I'll just introduce you this final idea of shared critical feedback literacies. This idea originates from a paper by uh, Carlos and Winstow, where, uh, where they were formulating the idea of shared student and feedback, uh, student and teacher feedback literacies. In their paper, 
Collis and Winston uh, talk about how students and teachers might develop their feedback literacies in tandem, learning from each other, being on a mutual learning journey in a way. And I take this idea a bit further by asking whether it might be possible to understand feedback literacy not to be something that individual students and teachers possess, but something that resides in communities. And, and I also think that we, these communities do need to include uh, agents beyond students and teachers. Agents such as researchers, curriculum designers, policy makers. There are many agents whose actions affect feedback practice. And I do think that we need to look at feedback literacy on this broader scale. OK, let me just. One final idea that I'll give you is an ongoing. In a secondary classroom where I'm. I've been doing a co-design uh, project. Where we have been studying. How student, teacher and researcher feedback literacies take action in tandem as we have been co-designing mathematics assessment in a secondary classroom together. So this is not from a higher ed context, but we are uh, building a participatory action research model that will also be used in higher education context. So the idea of shared feedback literacy is between uh, me as an assessment researcher, a teacher and students, and perhaps even other agents such as in this project, a special education teacher also needed to take part because um, they were a part of the learning community. So what I did was that I actually lived with this uh, classroom community for eight weeks. And I didn't just help the teacher to develop assessment and feedback practices based on earlier research, which I knew rather well, but I lived with the community and listened to their needs and they listened to my ideas and in tandem we work together and many of the ideas by the students were actually in a way more insightful than some of the ideas from research. So uh, this is a very small scale uh, participatory action research uh, project, but I think it's a good example of a win-win situation for everyone. Better uh, assessment and feedback practices were developed. Perhaps our <laughs> feedback literacy were developed in the, pro uh, in the process and everyone gets publications. So it, in, in a many way, everyone were the winners in, in this project. I'd be happy to share some, some details if anyone's interested, but now I do need to move on. So all right. So my key point in this second part of the presentation is that we do gain something as we frame feedback literacy as a critical practice that strives for more sustainable futures of higher education. But then the question is, if we see all these different agents in feedback, student, teachers, researchers, admins, other stakeholders, what is the shared goal of these stakeholders? So what we need, I argue, is some kind of a vision and also a plan for more sustainable futures of feedback and feedback literacy. And next up, I would have <laughs> a bit of a group task, which is uh, a bit of a silly task because I thought that for a Friday morning and for my Friday afternoon, something very serious might have not been, <laughs> might not be a good idea. So what I would ask you to do in, in um, breakout rooms is that I would ask you to think about your feedback utopias and how to get a bit closer to, closer to it. So what the idea of a utopia means. Here I refer to feedback utopias as some kind of a perfect place where there are no practical barriers. And I would ask you to, in groups, to have a discussion about what would your feedback utopia look like if there were no practical uh, barriers for this at all? What is your ideal uh, feedback practice or design in higher education? If you would have all the money and all the resources in the world, you can think about this beach you can see in the picture, <laughs> a place where you would really like to be. Um, that is, in a way, a silly task. Of course, we do have these practical barriers in real life. So I would also like you to come up with two practical ways that can be very small things that uh, teachers and researchers could take to get closer to that utopia. So one practical step, step for teachers, and one practical step for researchers. So what could feedback literate teachers and researchers do to get one step closer to your specific utopia? We'll be working on Padlet, and here you can see the uh, link, and you can also follow the QR code. So 
I can uh, copy paste the link to the chat and Martin, if you could start the uh, breakout rooms. Yeah, I will start the breakout rooms and we will be back in 50 minutes. OK, excellent. So I will assign you to the rooms and the rooms are numbered and you can use the numbers in the padlets. Oh, it's so funny, this uh, digital teleportation. <laughs> are we all back in the main room? Yeah, I think so. All right, so we have roughly 10 minutes for to wrap up the session and have a discussion. I, I can see from the Padlet that there's been quite a lot of discussion. I wonder if any group would like to share any key ideas that they have. Mm. Are you feeling hopeful or pessimistic after this <laughs> little task? Well, it, I was in group three, and what I think was a very nice uh, utopia that was sketched by one of the um, conversation uh, participants was Utopia would be if feedback would not need to be organized any longer because it is such an intrinsically and automatically process that starts from curiosity. I think that is indeed we, we didn't reach the point how to get there, but the utopia in itself, I think it was uh, really nicely um, described. That's yeah, very powerful. Yeah goes back to the idea of a feedback as a dialogue or interaction and how I guess all living organisms do that more or less all the time. We constantly process the information from our environment and then do something with that information. So that, I guess that's also true for educational feedback. Um, any other utopias that other groups would like to present? I know that we have some brilliant conversations in, in my group, so if someone would like to say something. Yeah, we have Mieke. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at the Padlet and what I recognize for, from our discussion in an, another group is that uh, when it's in a small group with uh, only a few people interacting, that feedback might be um, evolved quite naturally, although it still can be hard to be uh, critical or to be vulnerable. Uh, but what to do with uh, those big, big, big groups? I think that's the big challenge. And in U Utopia, that would be solved. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> that. That's the tricky thing that that gets mentioned over and over in feedback research. What to do with large class sizes? And there are so many brilliant pedagogical innovations in this field: so digital automatic feedback audio feedback, video feedback. So we definitely have solutions. But how to reach that ultimate utopia in uh, the context of uh, widening higher education systems globally, that's that, that's certainly a question that um, I argue requires us to talk about the ultimately the politics of higher education, of what, what is going on to this uh, whole uh, level of education and what is the purpose of that. So I, I think that seemingly practical question of class sizes always leads you to like a very deep rabbit hole of talking about the whole politics of higher ed. We any other about, yeah. huh? oh yes <laughs> we we talked go, about, go, go. Uh, about the um, um well in in my group uh there was a, a one one teacher who told us about uh, their um experiments with changing the feedback culture within their course. Um, and uh, sh she was wishing for a utopia in which um, uh, students and teachers wouldn't experience any barriers anymore in asking for feedback, in receiving feedback, in giving feedback. So, um, and I guess that um, 
uh, concerns uh, as well the system as the socialization as the individual skill. Yeah, our group had similar conversations about the fear of failure in a classroom and how in our utopia, perhaps uh, students wouldn't have this uh, these social norms about what it is, what it means and what it is to fail in front of other other students and, and teachers and how that might in fact be uh, quite a huge barrier for, for feedback practices. And I can uh, really relate to this story. Uh, shifting from the Finnish higher ed teaching culture to the one in Hong Kong. It's this it's really mostly a matter of this fact. The, it's a matter of how to <laughs> uh, how to use my feedback literacy to design feedback in a way that doesn't make anyone lose their face in the classroom. But while at the same time promoting the idea that everyone can fail and everyone has to fail. And and in those situations, feedback really shows its power. That's these are tricky things, and yeah, how how to reach that utopia? There are small things we can all do, but perhaps some <laughs> bigger cultural shifts also need to happen. Might anyone want to continue? Perhaps I could, we still have a few minutes. One question that I would be interested in asking from, from all of you is, how do you see the role of research, feedback research in this quest of, I don't know, we'll never reach those utopias. That's the point of utopias, but we can't get too pessimistic. I do argue that we need to take at least those baby steps towards the utopias. <laughs> we do need to have some kind of plan. So what do you think? What is the role of feedback researchers? If you're a teacher, what do you want from us, <laughs> the feedback researchers? Any thoughts? Brenda was first. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, well, I'm working in a high school now, and we're designing a curriculum in which we feedback literacy has a for a big role and I would what I really would love is researchers in the classrooms or research that are very close to the students to follow them and to see what happens how they learn how they use feedback why they don't ask for feedback how what they so to get more insight in the in the learning process of the student including using asking uh, using feedback, asking feedback, uh, all the barriers that they, um, all that sort of things. That would I really like. And, and for my purposes, uh, I'm working at the University of Applied Sciences. We're always looking for uh, didactic, uh, didactics, a uh, pedagogical practice that we can sort of take off the shelf as it were and, and say we're following this practice because um, then we can say it's based upon research. So what I, re I personally really want from feedback research is, is, a, is a pedagogy, is a model that I can say, okay, it's not a perfect model, but we're going to implement this model and see what it does rather than a piecemeal, this, 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 but a pedagogy because then it's easy to explain to all my colleagues we're following model X. And we have Christina as well with uh, raised yes, her hand. Sorry, trying to put on uh, my uh, camera. Um, I also uh, I advise a lot of uh, uh, how do you call it? I'm sorry, my English is not that well, especially not in the, on this Friday morning. Uh, I am I'm advising a lot of uh, uh, how do you call it? Opleidingen um, programs. Sorry, uh, sorry programs. Thank you. Programs uh, in, uh, in in this uh, in in uh, programmatically assessment and feedback literacy and feedback and all kinds of uh, you know things like that. And what I really uh, notice is that there are two things that we aren't uh, well equipped to: is that management 
has uh, still a different thinking about learning and is acting upon that old traditional uh, looking on learning and then the um well the the i'm so sorry the teachers they are trying to make a difference they uh they just uh, they have a lack of uh, you know organize in an organization and in a way they can facilitate uh, the uh, the feedback uh, on the uh, yeah with the with the students so that's one point and the other point is also that there is a lot of thinking that you know when you have to spend a lot of time on helping uh, students and learners to think about how they learn, why they learn, why feedback is important to them. Um, they also mislike, uh, they think that it's maybe it's um, costing their time uh, to really give education. <laughs> and that's also a sort of in the brains of a lot of teachers, there's an error going on then. They think, oh no, then I can just tell them what uh, what they have to learn and things like that. And just so I'm really searching for um, for uh, more uh, knowledge about the facts of uh, feedback on really, uh, you know, the learning results. And that would help people to really spend their time more on feedback and less maybe on sending The more research on the effectiveness effectivity of uh, feedback is that yeah okay thank you i would have like 15 things on my mind but martin i know that we are <laughs> out of time so yeah so i think it ends yeah. here you so thank you very much for this inspiring webinar and um, for the cool this uh, the discussion you you raised here and um, yeah a lot of insights for us and and work to do so um, once more thank you very much and uh, hopefully we can be in touch in the future to discuss more about this so thank you for your time and also thanking all the participants for being here and sharing your uh, ideas and questions. And as I said, we will uh, share the, the recordings and um, the slides afterwards on our website. will be in one or two weeks available on our website. Thank you all. Thank you so much, everyone. I've just posted my email address just in case you are interested in the paper, if you don't have an access to it or if you have any further questions. Excellent. Thank you.